Welcome to the fourth and final video for SL09. In this video, we'll be looking at what happens when enolates react with different kinds of electrophiles. We'll still be focusing on carbonyls, but rather than ketones and aldehydes, we'll specifically be looking at what happens when we use carboxylic acid derivatives as our electrophilic species. So this would include things like esters, or acid chlorides, or maybe even things like amines. So to get started, we can look at a generic reaction. So we'll go back to our I don't know, I guess our friend, the enolate with the benzene ring, since we seem to use this a lot. Mm, easy to draw, only one possible enolate forms from the structure, that seems good. And let's choose a ester. And I feel a little bit like Bob Ross. It's like, oh, you know, give him a happy friend, another alkyl chain. We'll use a methyl ester. So this type of a structure. And we need to think about what would happen if this enolate encountered this ester. Well, we're going to use rules. So we know that our carbon here is our alpha carbon. And it's nucleophilic in this form. It's already been deprotonated, so we have a good nucleophilic site. And then if I look at the ester, then I know that the carbonyl is electrophilic. So what is left for me to do is to connect those two. And I've done this enough times with enolates now to know that if I'm drawing the major resonance structure where I have an O minus, I'm going to show an arrow forward that shows the reformation of a CO pi bond. Electrons will then get transferred into a new bond between the nucleophilic carbon and the electrophilic carbon. And then finally, that's going to require breaking the carbonyl carbon or the CO double bond of the electrophile. So this looks like an addition step. <clears throat> And that's what we would expect to see. So we'll show this as reversible for now, since I'm not sure whether this will be favorable or not. And I'm just going to follow my arrows. So this carbon will have two carbons. That's here. And the new bond that I'm forming would be the new bond to this, to this alpha position. So here we go. There's my new bond. And... O minus, it looks like. All right, I'm going to break the CO double bond there. I'm still going to have a methoxy group attached. And then I'll have a 1, 2, 3 carbon chain. 1, 2, 3. Okay, so I should have a product that looks like this. Hmm, if I look at this, it looks like an addition. And I'm doing an addition to a carboxylic acid center where I generate something that looks like a O. Oh, Oh, a tetrahedral intermediate. Okay, so what do things do when they're tetrahedral intermediates? They eliminate. So if I follow my arrows where I'm eliminating the group that is most able to stabilize negative charge, that would be this O from the methoxy group, then I will have a compound that looks like this with my chain. And we're going to have an O-M-E minus. And I'm just going to go ahead and color in the CC bond that we made in the addition step so we can keep track of it in this final product. It's right there. So I have an addition elimination. And what that means is that, nucleo that uh, enolates can be nucleophiles for snap reactions. Which is great, because that means that we actually can tie in this SLO, or specifically this part of the SLO, to something that you've thought about a lot. Snack reactions, whether they're favorable, this is the mechanism that you should memorize the addition elimination. So hopefully you were watching this and being like, I know where this is going, hurry the hell up. Um, so there's one other wrinkle I want to introduce here. And that's this product we're going to call a beta diketone. Beta di ketone because relative to one of the carbonyls, the other carbonyl is beta. And both of those carbonyls are involved in ketone functional groups. So 
If I look at the structure here, it looks like I have a very acidic proton. The proton I've drawn out. So our alpha hydrogen pKa here is about 10. Because if I actually removed it, maybe with like my methoxy group, which is now a reasonably strong base, I could form a highly resonance stabilized anion. It looks like this. And I'll have methanol as my other <clears throat> my other group. So yeah, methanol is fun to write it this way because it's homey. It's kind of great. So this acid-base reaction is favorable toward this carbon anion. pKa of methanol is about 15, and then we decided that this beta diketone has a pKa of around 10. So uh, this is actually a favorable protonation. And it's, it's a common fate for some kinds of leaving groups in these snack reactions, assuming the anions are sufficiently basic. So one of the questions that we would typically ask about a snack reaction is whether it's favorable or not. It's a good question. So how do I assess this? Well, what we're going to look at essentially is the, the beginning anion and the final anion of the process. So in the reaction I'm showing here, where an enolate is reacting with an ester, I would consider the enolate anion. So this one here that I'm starting with. And I would actually consider this anion. This is the final product of the reaction. It doesn't stop here because the thing I made as my leaving group will deprotonate the product of the elimination step. So I'm comparing this carbon anion versus this carbon, or this, this anion here. Well, if you actually go ahead and draw the resonance structures for this compound, I bet you can figure out which of these two anions is more stable. So we have an enolate that looks like this. Okay. Note that I can delocalize the lone pair in the same way that we did an enolate back in the first video of the series. And the other oxygen in the beta diketone can also carry some of the electron density. So we would have another resonance structure which would look pretty similar, um, but the other oxygen is bearing the anion. So I would think that the beta diketone anion is quite a bit more stable than the enolate that we started with. And that means that the snack reaction plus deprotonation of the product will be favorable. So assess favorability by comparing Start an enolate to final, this is critical, that you know what the final anion will be, anion formed. Okay, so in the example that we just looked at at the beginning of this video, so this reaction that we did the mechanism for, this would be favorable because we've generated an anion that's more stable than what we started with. So in the next section of this video, we'll look at some permutations and some example problems where we're using this general notion that enolates can be the nucleophile for snack reactions. So one thing that we need to consider is how would we have formed the enolate that we started off this video with? And we know that from our conversation with aldol reactions that we're always worried about not just the mechanistic features, but also how you would actually run these reactions in the lab. And just like we saw in the yellow video, there's a few options for how we would go about doing this. One of those options would be to start with the ketone from which the enolate will be generated. First, treat the ketone with a strong base to irreversibly form the enolate. Then introduce the electrophilic, in this case, ester. And that would give us the final anion that we discussed in the previous section. But it's going to be difficult for us to isolate this compound because it's charged. So normally what we do in these kinds of reactions is in our third step, We'll add some kind of an acid. It could be a weak acid, like acetic acid, or you could use like a dilute HCl. Those all work. Just to put a proton back on the structure so that you could actually isolate uh, the final product. Right? So this workup step, we'll say, is acidic water, so H3O plus, 
That means we don't have to decide which specific acid to use. Workup. And what that step will do is take one of the protons from the acid, and it alters the structure of the final product that will form such that we end up with a neutral species. So this is the compound we would actually have isolated. Just a small wrinkle, and we see the same details that we've seen before, that we typically have multiple stages for a reaction. In a lot of cases, we would preform the enolate irreversible using our bases like sodium hydride or LDA. Then we would introduce the electrophile. In this case, it was an ester. And then we would do this workup. Right? So the thing that's kind of really new here for this section of this, of this video is the workup step. And it's not going to always be required. So we could think about another kind of an example that's very similar. So we'll use a different ketone. And let's do a slightly different procedure. So let's treat this with LDA first. And then let's treat this with an acid chloride. So another carboxylic acid derivative that's electrophilic. Um, and so we'll choose this one. And then we'll need to decide in a minute whether or not we need a third stage for this reaction, which would be some kind of a workup. So to get started, we'll think about roles. And what I'd like for you to do, just to help you remember what you've learned before in this SLO, is just based off of the first step, which enolate will form from this ketone. So pause your video and draw the structure of the enolate that forms from LDA reacting with this ketone. So we know that LDA is what's called a kinetic base, and that means that it will give us the enolate that forms most easily, that forms with the least amount of steric hindrance. And that's typically going to be the less substituted enolate that we could form, which means that our enolate structure will have a CC that will bond between these two carbons, and it makes this particular alpha position here nucleophilic. So you could have written this as a CC double bond with an O minus, or you could have written this as a carbonyl with a negative charge on the carbon, which I've labeled N. Either of those are fine. Remember, those are resonance structures of the enolate. So then the next question would be, once we have this enolate, where will the nucleophilic carbon uh, engage? And so if we look at the structure that we're adding in after the enolate forms, in particular, the carbonyl carbon here looks like a good option. And so that means that we could reliably connect our nucleophilic carbon to our carbonyl carbon that we've labeled as an electrophile. But there's one wrinkle here, and that's that we know initially we do an addition that will give a tetrahedral intermediate, and we can know that based on the fact that this is an acid chloride or a carboxylic acid derivative, that we're going to do a snack. So carboxylic acid derivative, derivative equals SNAC. So that means that we're going to do a substitution. That's what the S stands for. And we'll substitute the nucleophilic atom for the leaving group, in this case, the chlorine. So if I follow that pattern, and you're welcome to write the mechanism out for this if you'd like, I'm going to have my ketone, my six-membered ring, a new CC bond, so this one here, I'll just make it bold, and a CC double bond from the electrophilic atom, like so. So it looks like I'm making a beta diketone again. I want to make sure that I connected the right things, so we know that this carbon was nucleophilic and this carbon was electrophilic when the reaction happened. That looks good. And from the elimination, I'm going to make Cl minus. That was the leaving group for the acid chloride. So like we saw in the first section of this video, I would also need to consider what would happen to the proton that's between the two carbonyls in the product. We know that it has a pKa of around 10. So what I need to decide is, can Cl- react with that proton? Well, if Cl- removed the red proton, I'd make HCl which has a pKa of like negative 6. We also know HCl is a super strong acid, so that's probably not very likely. This compound here, Cl- is not basic enough to deprotonate the product. So if that, that means that we'll never form an anion at this carbon. And that means I actually don't need to work it. 
I mean, you could do it, I guess, but like, there's no point. So it really depends on what your leaving group structure is. This is just essentially a review of other concepts we've used throughout the semester. So it's a good opportunity for you to help study for finals, biochem, MCAT, all that stuff, just to keep using the same principles we've been discussing. Um, so the other thing I want to point out is this snack reaction is favorable because I'm comparing, you can do this in a couple of ways, either the LDA anion itself or more reasonably, the enolate that would form or CO minus. So which of those two anions is more stable? And we can use PKAs for that also because we know that they're proxies for anion stability. So the proton on my nucleophilic site here is going to have a PKA of about 20, alpha hydrogen of a ketone. CO minus we talked about is having a conjugate acid PKA of about negative 6. So the CO minus anion is far more stable than the starting enolate, and that means that the snack reaction is favorable. So we can say our reaction is favorable overall because enolate anion less stable than leaving group anion, in this case CL minus. Okay, so uh, we'll look at a couple of other examples with these kinds of reactions, where enolates are doing snack reactions. I'd like to do a couple of things. I'd like to look at more kinds of carbonyl electrophiles, so different kinds of carboxylic acid derivative functional groups. And I also want to try to vary my uh, enolate species a little bit, because the structures of the products that we form tend to look pretty different, depending on the kind of enolate you use. So let's use an aldehyde. Um, let's use... a three carbon chain, aldehyde like so. And we will react this with, uh, let's do an amide, and let's do treat this with LDA first to make our enolate. So we'll do a tertiary amide. And it will be easy for us to keep track of which carbonyl comes from which of our reactants by making this a, a phenyl group attached to a carbonyl. So we can follow where the pH goes, and that will help us figure out which carbonyl is this one. And then what we're not sure about a workup yet. So we can, we can do this in a couple of stages. First, we want to find out what we're deprotonating. That will be the alpha carbon here. So this carbon will be nucleophilic. Our amide carbonyl is electrophilic. We know it's not particularly electrophilic, but that would be the place where you would actually have chemistry happening. And so if I connect those two through a snack process, in this case, this nitrogen group will be the leaving group. So it'll take the nitrogen or both methyls, that'll come off. It'll be replaced with the uh, nucleophilic carbon. Remember, this is not an SN2, right? A lot of people have been describing this in office hours as like the tack and the leaving group happens and it's all happening at the same time. No, addition step makes a tetrahedral intermediate, which eliminates two steps. So that would give us our starting aldehyde back, a new bond, so this is the new bond, and then the carbonyl of the amide with our phenyl group. So I'm going to highlight the new CC bond here, like so. And our leaving group would be and ionic in this case, like that. And so the last thing I'll need to decide is, okay, so like what happens to the product? This compound would be a beta keto aldehyde. So aldehyde alpha beta is a ketone. You get the kind of nomenclatural idea. But because I've got the two carbonyls that are flanking a single carbon here, I still have an acidic proton in the final product. Right, so I can think about the fate of this hydrogen here. It's PKA will also be around 10. You can assume that protons between two carbonyls like this have PKAs of around 10. And I could do an acid base reaction wherein I transfer that green hydrogen to the leaving group because this structure should be fairly basic. Nitrogen anions aren't that stable. So I'll end up with the deprotonated form of the product. Looks like this, and I'm 
Oops, one longer, sorry. H, there we go. And just for complete mistake, I'll make this screen so we can keep track of where the hydrogen is going. Okay, so this acid base reaction was highly favorable. So the pKa of our conjugate acid is about 35. And the pKa of our green proton we said was about 10. So we're making a much weaker acid from this acid base reaction. This looks good. We also know that the protons alpha to these aldehydes have pKa is around 20 or 18, something like that. And that tells us that the enolate that forms from this aldehyde is actually going to be quite a bit less stable than this anion. You could use the pKa's. You could also use resonance arguments like we did earlier in this video. Right, we're going to have one resonance acceptor for the anion that we put here. On this carbon, we've got two different resonance acceptors, which makes this anion more stable. So that means that this reaction is favorable. We do have a different issue in this case, and that's the relative electrophilicity of amines. We learned back in SLO, I think, 6 and 5, that these compounds are, amides, are really not good electrophiles. These are the compounds that have those hydrolysis half-lives of like 4,000 years. So these enolates are not sufficiently nucleophilic to react with amides. In fact, remember, amides didn't even react with Grignards or organolithium reagents, really, which are much, much better nucleophiles than these enolates are. So in this particular case, we have a rate problem. So a very slow reaction because amides are only weakly electrophilic at the carbonyl. So in principle, this snap can happen, could happen, but you might be waiting a while. All right, so let's look at one other example, and we'll change our nucleophile to an ester. So we'll stick with a methyl ester. And we'll use a relatively simple compound like this, and let's do this with, um, well, let's use sodium hydride this time. I just like to keep varying things. So we've got some sodium hydride. And let's treat this with, I don't know, let's use like another ester as an electrophile. We could do that, right? We saw a case where an ester was an electrophile earlier. Um, so let's use like an ethyl. And then let's use a phenyl group again. This is going to help us remember which carbonyl goes with which of my two reactants. And I'm not sure about a workup yet. So, oh. Apologies. This step. We are making this anion, so we would need a workup. I totally forgot to come back to that. Jeez. Apologies. Okay, so back to this problem. Um, so we're going to start the same way we always start. Where would we deprotonate in this structure? Well, the proton alpha on that alpha carbon. So that would be here. That would be my nucleophilic site. It's the only place I can deprotonate. And that nucleophilic site will react with whatever is electrophilic and what I'm introducing in the second stage, which is going to be the carbonyl carbon. Noticing a pattern. I'm sure you're very annoyed right now. Um, and that's going to give us, after both addition and elimination, two separate steps, substitution for the OET group. This will be my leaving group, which I'll color in. for our snack, and I'll replace the leaving group with the nucleophilic atom and everything else attached to it. So that means I'll still have an ester in the product. It will be the methyl ester. This group's not leaving because it's just following the nucleophilic site here. Our new CC bond will be here from the alpha position that was nucleophilic to our electrophilic carbon. I'll get a carbonyl. And the phenyl group will be attached. And you'll have the leaving group that's departed, so ETO minus. Okay, so a couple of things I want to point out here. Uh, one is that this compound looks kind of different. It still has an ester in it. We call this a beta, beta keto ester. 
So there's a ketone at the alpha beta position to the ester. And it has an acidic proton, just like all the other species that we've seen so far. So the hydrogen between the carbonyls will have a pKa around 10. And that means that when we actually do this reaction, rather than isolating this compound directly with ETO minus, this is going to be sufficiently basic to remove the green proton. And so what we get instead is ethanol. and the anion here, so it would need a workup. So you can see the workup is pretty typical. Acid chlorides are kind of the exception. Please don't memorize that. Please think about why we would need that workup step. That will, that will turn out to be important in, um, in subsequent sections of this video. So we've seen a few examples here. Again, lots of permutations. So this is a little bit like when we did carbonyl reductions. It's better not to try to memorize all of these different permutations and instead use the pattern of an enolates a nucleophile that participates in a snack reaction. And that tells you exactly what you need to do. Find the leaving group in your electrophile and replace it with the nucleophile at the alpha position. That's way easier. Okay, so in the next section of this video, we'll be looking at a permutation of these kinds of reactions where ester nucleophiles react with ester electrophiles. So it turns out that the last reaction we looked at in the previous section of this video has a special name. It's called a Claisen condensation. So this is a reaction where an ester enolate reacts with an ester electrophile. And in some cases, we even use it to describe any enolate reacting with an ester electrophile. But in a lot of ways, it looks very much like the Albaugh reaction in terms of how it was originally discovered, which is that we can take esters that look like this and simply treat them with a mixture of protic solvent, like in this case, methanol, and some kind of a relatively weak base, so in this case, sodium methoxide, which would be a source of MaO minus. So in this case, what we find is that we have a reversible deprotonation between OME minus and our starting ester. So we'll start working through the mechanism for our Claisen condensation here. We know that the proton here has a pKa of around 25. So we've got our methoxide that can deprotonate to make our nucleophilic enolate. I'm going to show the formation of the enolate as if we're going directly to the structure that's the major resonance structure. Remember that it's not like these are different products. I'm just representing it as the major resonance structure. So acid-base chemistry right, is reversible. And then we have a new enolate and methanol. Okay, so that's our first step. We've definitely made a better nucleophile here. Right? We've got our enolate position, or our alpha carbon is now part of an enolate. And our starting, our final acid here, pKa, is about 15. So this reaction is actually kind of unfavorable, right? We're going to be making a stronger acid from a weaker one. And we've talked about this in a few different cases throughout the SLO. That what we're basically doing is describing uh, these reversible enolate formations by using kind of semi-unfavorable or unfavorable acid, acid base reactions. So in this case, this enolate can now, it's going to form in very small amounts. So that's to say if you had like millions of molecules like this, you might have one or two that become enolates. This is a pretty big difference in pKa, so only tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of the ester get deprotonated. But in a way, that's kind of good for us, because as soon as that happens, this compound's looking around and it's like, hmm, all these other esters, they're not enolates, and that means they're still electrophilic. So this compound can react with a copy of what it used to be. It's kind of sad, really, if you think about it. It's like pining for what I used to be. Um, do a little wrap around there. For the first step of our snack reaction, so this is the addition part. We know that that is reversible. And so that will give us a tetrahedral of immediate. It looks like so. Got a seam right there. It's hard to work around. Oh, I mean. And this addition step is probably also relatively unfavorable. 
carbon yields are definitely going to be more stable than their tetrahedral intermediate counterparts. So backwards, forwards. And then finally, we have our elimination. So that's going to involve ejection of methoxide in this case. So the best leaving group from the tetrahedral intermediate. Also the leaving group you identified in the electrophilic species. And that's going to give rise to our beta keto ester that we learned about in the last section of our video. Different structure, but same name, because we've got a ketone that's alpha beta to an ester. And that's going to give us OME minus as well. OK, so this is an equilibrium. So in this case, we have a problem. And that's that most of these steps are reversible, but most of them are unfavorable or essentially neutral in terms of their, their favorability, which suggests that this Claisen condensation should really not give product, right? It shouldn't be very, shouldn't be all that helpful for us. But one, things that's, one of the things that's interesting is that because we have this acidic proton in the final product, the leaving group that we generate, this OLB minus, this look, looks like it could be catalytic. We start with OLB minus, we end with OLB minus, but we have this final step where we deprotonate the product, in this case using OLB minus, and that actually is the favorable step. Right, so all of this stuff here that I'm showing, all unfavorable, but we have this final deprotonation, which is going to give us this highly stabilized anion. We've seen them in numerous sections of the previous, uh, of the previous section of the video. And that drives the whole process. Right? So this is an example of Le Chatelier's principle, where we take a set of unfavorable equilibria, and we're basically pulling compounds through this unfavorable equilibrium so that we can... Because at this very end, we have something that's super favorable. So we're like making this chemistry happen against the wishes of nature, essentially, because we're giving something nature at the very end that it likes. And nature's like, well, okay, fine. Well, I've this thing at the end I really like, I'll do all this stuff. That's cool, as long as I have a payoff at the end. This is like we talked about previously in the semester. This is exactly how ATP hydrolysis is important for us. There's lots of reactions that happen inside biochemical systems or bio biological systems that are unfavorable. Intrinsically, nature doesn't want them to happen, but it likes hydrolyzing ATP. And so a lot of reactions are coupled, or enzymes or clusters of enzymes are coupled so that they will hydrolyze ATP to pay for, essentially, reactions that are unfavorable in other ways. So we're doing the same thing here. There's no ATP involved, but it's the same concept. And that means that our final product, in principle, should look like an anion. But we know we can't really isolate those compounds. So we're also going to have our good old friend, the acidic water workup, to put our proton back on. All right, so the Claisen condensation looks a lot like what we've been doing in previous sections of this video, done with a reversible deprotonation rather than an irreversible one. So in that way, it's a little bit like how we saw aldol reactions in the previous video, that you can do them either by preforming enolates or you can do it using uh, weaker bases with some kind of unfavorable deprotonation step. And the new part here is, well, it's not that new for the video, we have this workup. Okay, so let's look at a couple of other examples of this Claisen condensation in action. We could look at one other reaction here as an example of another Claisen condensation, which again we've seen before. We saw that in the previous section. Remember, this is any case where we have, really where we have an ester electrophile reacting with an enolate. Um, sometimes it's used in a more specific way, which is just to talk about an ester nucleophile reacting with an ester enolate. Um, so we'll look at the latter, so another example that looks a lot like this. And we'll change up our ester structure a little bit. So what I'm going to ask for you to do is to predict the product here, just to make sure that you have some practice, and that way I can go through it once you're done, so that we can make sure you can assess these kinds of problems correctly. All right, so those are the conditions, right? We're going to treat this ester, which remember, we're representing a collection of many molecules with just this structure, with potassium ethoxide, ethanol, as a solvent. We'll heat this, and the heating is really about reaction rates. Esters aren't fantastic electrophiles, so providing some heat makes it go a bit faster. And then finally, once the reaction's all done, this workup. So what I want you to do is to actually provide the final structure after everything has been done, what you would actually isolate. 
So you've had a chance to work this through. And I hope that what you're doing is kind of decoding first, rather than trying to rub your temples and come up with a structure here. So I know that I have a base. This oxygen here is negatively charged. It's not a great base, but maybe I can form a little bit of an enolate from it. And that's what I need to do next, is well, where would I form an enolate? So this proton here is at an alpha position. And that means that I can deprotonate it. And that's going to make the alpha position nucleophilic. OK, so now I've identified my nucleophilic site, this carbon here. And I would need to think about, well, what could that react with? And so one of the challenging parts of these problems is to remember that you'll have other molecules that look just like this that aren't yet enolates. I know it sounds like it's very kind of nitpicky, but these, these contextual details matter a lot in how both aldol reactions and the Claisen condensation work, right? But that's what we talk so much about reversible versus irreversible formation of enolates. It makes a big difference for how we interpret the problems. So what we would need to think about then is like if you had a nucleophile of this carbon and another copy of this molecule, we could say that the carbonyl of the ester would be the electrophile in the other copy. So we would need to connect this structure to another of its own, but with the sites that we've labeled. In other words, we need to make a homodimer. And so to do that, what I'm going to do is draw the starting ester again. And I'm just going to start by locating where the new CC bond needs to go. So I know it's going to be a part of the alpha position. So that's here. That's my new bond. And then I'm going to connect to that the electrophilic carbonyl from the other copy of my starting material. And that's going to be like so. So there's my carbonyl. And then what's attached to this carbonyl? Well, an OAT group and then also this chain. So which of those is more likely to be a leaving group? Probably the OAT. So that means I can draw the rest of this chain in. And I'm going to have ethoxide or OAT minus floating around, which will deprotonate this carbon, which is good, right? That's what's going to drive the reaction forward, and you can actually make product. But once the workup is done, that proton goes back on. So this would be the exact structure that I would expect to get. OK, so in the last section of this video, we'll be looking at a variant of the Claisen condensation where we do the reaction in an intramolecular sense. So this is a lot like an intramolecular aldol, but it's going to turn out it has a special name. So if we perform a Claisen condensation on a molecule that contains two esters, like this one, we don't call it a Claisen condensation anymore. We call it a Diekmann condensation, right? This is an Austrian chemist, which means you have to really pronounce it that way. I mean, you're kind of obligated. Have you ever listened to Arnold Schwarzenegger? Get to the chopper! So really what we need to do here is find electrophilic and nucleophilic sites. And because we know that this could be an intramolecular reaction, because those sites will probably be in the same structure, we probably should number our chain, just like we learned about with the aldol condensation, uh, intramolecular aldol, excuse me. So our carbonyls are the same. This molecule is symmetrical. So I'm going to assign electrophilicity to one of my two carbonyls arbitrarily. I chose the left one. But that means that in this reaction with an intramolecular case, it's going to be this carbon that's the nucleophilic site. Right? One of the carbonyls is going to get deprotonated at its alpha position to become nucleophilic. The other will serve as an electrophile. Right, the same, these two labels can't go on the same carbonyl because, well, once you're an enolate, you're not electrophilic anymore. So the next thing I need to do is number, and I'm going to include the carbonyl carbons themselves. So I'll have one, two, three, four, five, and six. So uh, that means I'm connecting carbon two to carbon six. Two, two, six. And if I count, that's going to end up being a five number ring. So what I'm going to do is start with this drawing of pentagon, and I'm going to draw the carbonyl that was the electrophile, which in this case would be carbon-6. That's going to be in the ring. I'm going to be making a bond from this carbon to this one. That means that I'm forming a ring by attaching 2 to 6, and I'm just going to say that that's carbon-6 there at the top because drawing carbonyls at the top of rings is satisfying, and so this will be 6, 5, 4, Two and then on carbon two, I have my carbonyl and or my ester, excuse me, because remember this part of the molecule that's not going to change. It's just acidifying this alpha position, so the alpha position can act as a nucleophile under these reaction conditions. So I'll have 
a compound that looks like this. So carbon one is outside the ring. And if I follow my work carefully, this new CC bond is here. Which is good because that's what I meant to do. And I know that that's also going to be true because it's a CC bond that's forming off of the alpha carbon that I'm assigning nucleophilicity to. So uh, we can see that we still make beta keto esters, but now they're cyclic beta keto esters. So let's look at one more example of the deep bond condensation. Um, so we'll change up our ester just a little bit. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and we'll do these conditions. Well, we need to work up. Okay, so we'll approach this the same way, but now I'd like for you to do it. So go ahead and pause your video, predict the final product that you get from this particular reaction. So we can begin working through this problem in the same way. We're going to identify electrophile and nucleophilic and electrophilic sites. We have to be a little bit more careful here, though, because the esters that we have here, they're not the same as each other. So if I look at them, I need to decide, well, which of these positions could be electrophilic? Well, they both could be in that case, but which of them could be nucleophilic? And now I have to actually do a little bit more careful uh, structural analysis. So this ester has an alpha hydrogen and is therefore deprotonatable. So I could have a nucleophile here could be deprotonated. It's a D. I haven't spelled anything wrong yet. It's kind of surprising. Um, so here's my nuke. Not possible here, right? I don't have any protons to remove with this alpha carbon. So no matter what kind of base I have, I'm never going to end up dumping a bunch of electron density into this site. And that means that for the purposes of this reaction, only this carbonyl can really serve as the electrophile if the reaction's intramolecular, which we can assume is going to be true. So that means that I need to actually now add my numbering. So I'll choose the same numbering from right to left. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And it looks like I'm going to be connecting two to seven in this case. So that tells me I'm going to have a six-numbered ring this time. So I'm going to put the carbonyl at the top of the ring because I like to. And that's going to be carbon 7. right? Remember that when we, end up, when we start with an ester, we're going to end up with a ketone here. And I can also uh, connect things like I did here. So we'll count number on the ring counterclockwise. Again, that's an arbitrary decision. You could have numbered around clockwise. But it is going to depend on where you put your groups. So I know that at carbon 2, that's my new CC bond between 2 and 7. Check. And that means that this whole ester unit is going to be sticking off of the ring, just like it was in the previous problem. So there's carbon 1. OK, so done? Oh, no. Be careful to make sure you add all of the substituents from your acyclic molecule onto your final product. So that means these two methyl groups, they're not changing. They're going to end up in the product too. And that means they're going to need to make sure I place them in the right spot. So they're both attached to carbon six, which means on the product in carbon six, I'm going to add methyl groups. Okay, so that would be the product of the decline condensation with this particular diester. All right, so that concludes the final video for SLO9. You're now prepared to work problems involving enolates. You can alkylate them. You know how to do aldol reactions and condensations. You also know how to do intramolecular aldol reactions. And you know how to use enolates for snack reactions, how to do Claisen reactions or condensations, and also how to do, well, you know. <laughs>